Here's the problem. The faster you drive, the more air will try to push you back. But you already know that. Well, duh. I mean, who here hasn't put their hand out of a window of a moving car? What you perhaps don't know is all the clever ways cars use to get around that problem. Hey guys, it's Type here with my list of the seven cars that mastered the air. Starting the list with the McLaren Speedtail, a car so slippery that some think it's made of those non-sticky Teflon pants. It isn't. It's mostly carbon fiber, elongated, tapered, streamlined, and in some places, bendy too. Thanks to a thousand horsepower hybrid engine that lurks within, this teardrop shaped slip Mac can easily reach 250 miles per hour, at which point the air resistance will make it feel more like you're driving through a fruitcake rather than the oncoming wind. But that's not the issue because every crease, every hole, every blade, and every line and shut line is there to make sure that this car punches through that cake like it's not even there. Starting with the sharp nose that cuts and channels the air around a car to the super narrow cabin for a reduced frontal area, then the smooth sides with closed off front wheels for less turbulence, giant air outlets that create curtains of fast flowing air, and even the side camera mirrors will retract to be flush with the body. Finally, the elongated sharp tail. Having a big sudden cutoff will create a lot of swirly air that slows the car down, but if you pinch that cutoff down to a sharp blade, the air will smoothly leave your car, just like the curling stone leaves the guy's hand. Now that's smooth. There's only one thing that bothers me. How come it's not faster than the Veyron? Moving on to number 6 is the GMA T50. Three decades after the legendary McLaren F1, its designer Gordon Murray decided to create an updated version. This. It inherited many traits from its older brother, a naturally aspirated V12, manual gearbox, three-seat layout, most of its shape, and even this aero fan. That too is just an improved version of a pair of hidden fans that the F1 had, but I bet you didn't know about those now, did you? So what does the fan do? In short, it just sucks. Literally, it creates a suction force above the car when you want more top speed, or beneath the car when you want more downforce. Others use wings, the T50 uses a vacuum cleaner, but it gets a bit more technical than that, so bear with me. If you put a giant butt crack, let's call it a diffuser, at the back of the car, it will try to separate the air flowing beneath it. This separation creates an internal vacuum that will try to close in on itself by sucking in everything around it, including the car and the road as well. The more you separate, the better. But that's not easy. The air doesn't want to bend that sharply, so unless you have an elongated car like the Speedtail, you simply run out of butt crack before you bend it to such an extreme angle. What the T50 does is it uses the fan and some channels to suck the top part of the airflow and break it away more. More brake, more vacuum, more downforce, more cornering speeds. Clever stuff, but ugly. Still, not as ugly as the number five on the list the Aston Martin Valkyrie. The reason why it's so hard on the eyes is because this car is a brainchild of Red Bull's F1 chief designer, and guys like him never really cared about such unimportant things as beauty. As long as it's fast, everything is allowed. And given that Valkyrie is aimed to be the fastest road legal car around the track, well, this is the result. An egg-shaped pod for you and the engine, plus the wheels at each corner, held together by a medley of sickly twisted shapes and gaping voids. The top part is mostly smooth and tightly fitted around every component, but below the belt line, that's where the wind magic is conducted. Look at the complexity of the wing hanging from the front. The way it turns and warps and separates into multiple layers, that's F1, baby. Behind it is just an empty space for channeling different vortexes and air flows of high and low pressures. These side blades, they too have an aero function, and so do these ribs on the floorboard. Nothing is here for aesthetics only. Round the back are the two largest, deepest Venturi tunnels you've ever seen on a car with number plates. So deep, in fact, that if you park your Valkyrie overnight in LA in the morning, you'll have two junkies sleeping in them. Cars usually have a lot of aero parts sticking out on the top, but the Valkyrie, it's all hidden below, and it still works just as well. Oh, I just realized what the car reminds me of. It's a horseshoe crab. Tiny beady eyes and all smooth on the top, but horrifyingly ugly from the bottom. Am I right or what? At number four is the antithesis of everything that we've talked about so far, the Dodge Charger Daytona. 
Take a look at the regular version and tell me, does this car look aerodynamic to you? No, of course not. It's all boxy, cumbersome. And how about those front intakes? They're like two parachutes scooping up all the air in the front of it. That's not good for speed. However, behind these parachutes lays a mighty big V8 engine that could fit only in a car of such girth. That turns out is good for speed, and a lot of it. Time to take the Charger to NASCAR to see just how much is a lot, but not before an actual rocket engineer from Chrysler's Ballistic Missile Division does some modifications to it. Yes, besides cars, Chrysler was also producing rockets that go boom. Anyway, Mr. Rocket Man was quick to identify one of the biggest issues. It needs to be pointy. So a crude sheet metal nose cone was installed at the front. Furthermore, gaps in the fenders were open to alleviate the high pressure around the wheels. The rear window was flush with the rear hunches. And how can anyone miss it? The gigantic wing that towered above the entire car was installed. Why so high? Because the cabin was still producing too much turbulent, dirty air that rising above it was the only way to make use of it. I know the whole car looks crude and childishly silly, but the Daytona was a proper missile on wheels, and with the real math behind it. A point that was soon proven when it managed to be the first car to break the 200 miles per hour mark at NASCAR. And number three is the General Motors EV1, the most aerodynamic production car ever made. But what about the super slippery speed tail, I hear you asking? Well, McLaren never revealed its CD number, the number that says how aerodynamic some object is. So, consider this. David Coulthard's head has a CD of 1.05, your mom is 0.47, and the EV1, well, that's just 0.19. And I strongly believe that the slip Mac can't go any lower than that. Here's why. The old placenta looking car is electric. It doesn't have an engine that burns fuel, so it doesn't need any openings for the cooling. The body is as smooth and as closed off as it can be, so it simply glides through the air. In fact, it's so effective at that, that without a speed limiter, this little subcompact can go over 160 miles per hour. That's an incredible result. On the other hand, McLaren does have an engine, which when boosting over a thousand horsepower can get really hot. Thus, there are these two big intakes that scoop the air in order to channel them through these. That's not very aerodynamic. Also, the McLaren can go really fast. So fast that if you don't use the air to push it down, it might try to take off. Remember the flying Merc? I see them. Here we go. Oh my god. Oh my god. The Mercedes has taken off. The EV1, as I mentioned before, is speed limited to 80 miles per hour only so it doesn't need to be bothered by such things. All in all, it's the most aero-efficient car ever. Beats the slipperiest modern electric stuff too. Number two is, again, a McLaren. As I'm sure you've noticed, the Elva doesn't have a windshield, and for a car that can go 200 miles per hour, that can be an issue. Imagine your face meets a wasp at such a speed. Its head will go straight through its own ass. Not the most pleasant feeling, and neither will this be your ugly mug being all twisted and mushed up. Speaking of faces, does it look like the Elva is pulling that DiCaprio look from the Wolf of Wall Street? You know, this one. It does. Anyway, the clever arrow story. Elva doesn't have a windshield because it creates one out of air. Here's how. As you go, the air in front of you is being scooped up by the DiCaprio face, then channeled through some ducts until it's finally shot straight up through this gigantic hood blowhole. This upward jet of air is strong enough to deflect the incoming wind and wasp and whatnot, leaving a bubble of calm air right around where the cabin would be. That's clever, but it does have some flaws. Drive faster in this 800 horsepower car and the jets won't be strong enough, at which point an ugly tray will raise up to protect it. It completely ruins the look of the otherwise pretty car. Drive even faster still and not even that'll help. So you'll need to wear a helmet. Still, at the right speed and with the right weather, nothing will beat the experience of driving a McLaren Elva. And finally, at numero uno, we have the latest Porsche 911 GT3 RS, a true airbender of the car world. It all starts at the front end, where instead of having a central cooler flanked by two smaller ones, there's now a gigantic one taken straight from the racing version. The hot air is then extracted through these nostrils, but you don't want it to go straight across the roof and back into the engine. Nuh uh uh which is why the nostrils have these flaps that steer the air sideways. And to stop the hot air from raising again, there are these two rails on the roof. 
They also aid in the straight line stability. And there's more. Flanking the big-ass radiator are now two active wings that work the same way as those flaps on Wyra. Big air extractors are alleviating the pressure buildup above the front wheels. These blades here and here and here create curtains of smooth flowing air. Even the suspension arms have been streamlined so that they add an extra 40 kilos of downforce at max speed. Lastly, the wing. Not only is it huge, but it also flips and flaps up or down, depending on if you're going down a straight or around a corner. There's so much going on that to get the best idea, it's easier to just show you a regular 911, and then the airbender one. Every difference you see there is for some reason, and the reason is more downforce, more grip, and ultimately, faster lap times. And now, three more cars that mastered the air. Let's see if you can guess them. Like, subscribe, support on Patreon, the usual stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.